welcome to this uh, great debate on is uh, open science the way to go. Um, we have a stellar, stellar panel for you uh, today. Um, and it covers really the all corners of the scholarly uh, ecosystem. So hopefully we can go through very different points of view uh, on the issue. Um, before I introduce the uh, panelists, um, I just want to lay out the rules of engagement. Um, this is a debate and there is no question or opinion that we shouldn't consider. So uh, I'd like to grant both the audience and the panelists full license to uh, play devil's advocate and uh, we can really explore uh, all points of the issue, especially uh, those sides that uh, make us uncomfortable. So um, I guess we should do it in order. <laughs> so uh, next to me uh, we have Professor Jean-Pierre uh, Bourguignon. Uh, he's a mathematician by uh, uh, training and has uh, spent his career at the uh, Centre National de uh, Recherche Scientifique in France. Um, he has uh, been the president of the uh, Société Mathématique de, de France uh, and has served as a director of the Institut des Hautes Études uh, Scientifiques between 94 and 2013. Um, and he's also uh, served on the board of the Euroscience uh, Organization and be, has been active on the Euroscience uh, Open Forum Committee since uh, 2004. And, uh, of course, uh, he is the current uh, president of the uh, European uh, Research Council serving since 2014. And uh, next on the line we have uh, Grace uh, Baines. Uh, she's uh, going to represent the, um, um, the publishers, I guess. Um, she's the director of marketing and development for open research at uh, Springer Nature. Uh, responsible for promoting uh, open data and uh, good data practices, um, uh, including the uh, journal Scientific uh, Data. Um, Grace uh, uh, is also involved in uh, um, open science and uh, her enthusiasm uh, dates back to uh, Biomed Central in 2003 uh, and since has uh, flourished and uh, she's now with Nature Publishing and uh, Springer. And next on the line, we have uh, Helen Glaves. Her day job is as a senior data scientist at the British Geological Survey, uh, where she's responsible for uh, a number of national and international uh, projects uh, in earth science data. Um, she's a uh, um, EGU Earth and, and uh, Space Science uh, Informatics Division uh, President, uh, and also a member of the Research Data Alliance Technical Advisory Board. Uh, she has also coordinated a uh, number of international ocean data in interoperability platform projects. So thank you for joining us. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Barbara Romanovic from the Collège de France and Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris. Um, she has studied mathematics at the École uh, Normale Supérieure and holds a PhD in geophysics from the uh, University of uh, Paris 7. Um, while working at uh, CNRS in France, she uh, developed the Geoscope, which uh, at the time was apparently the state-of-the-art global network for digital seismic stations for the study of earthquakes and structures of Earth's interior. Um, in 91, she was appointed a director of uh, uh, Berkeley's Seismological Laboratory, um, professor at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Berkeley. So uh, thank you to the panelists for joining us. Um, the way we're going to proceed, um, I think in the same order, we'll uh, give uh, the panelists five or uh, six minutes to offer us their point of view on the issue at hand. Is open science uh, the way to go and what are the pros and cons? So, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much for inviting me in this uh, context. So, here I'm in a sense uh, in the position of uh, uh, representing the generalist, um, and, uh, which means uh, several things. Uh, the three points I would like to make is, uh, is first of all, that uh, uh, open science is definitely for some uh, structures, like uh, the, well, the European Commission, something which is, uh, has been a policy st um, decision, and uh, therefore I will present what it uh, means. Second point is uh, insist, because this is something we are 
very much um, facing in the context of the European Research Council, the huge diversity of the practices of science, depending um, where you, you are. And this really makes the discussion of the issue of open science a very complicated one. And the last but not least um, is the fact that uh, any time you talk about open science, there are really several dimensions because, uh, of course, there is the scientific community, and as ERC, we feel really that we are there to be involved with the scientific community, but also there is next to it some, an economic sector which is uh, uh, very much uh, very active, and also since it's a very dynamic situation, the economic sector is uh, proactive, tries to position itself. But also there is the general public, which actually open science means really to involve more, much more broadly the public. So very quickly, because I, I have just a few minutes to start with a statement by the European Commission, which is uh, very clear, uh, concerning first uh, the, um, the question of access to data, open, open access. So you know since uh, 2014, it's something which is mandatory, that is uh, anybody who gets uh, supported by the European Commission, uh, and this includes European Research Council, has to just uh, organize uh, its publications or its, uh, all the data, uh, all the um, publication that uh, the person produces can take different forms, of course, articles, but could be also monographies, have to be made available uh, in open access under a very specific, uh, there is a specific definition of open access, which means there could be a delay, but not more than six months, except for social sciences and humanities, which can be 12 months in the embargo. So this is the position. Of course, open science is much broader than that. It has to do also with uh, open data and sharing data, and uh, definitely the European Commission is on its way to really making uh, data sharing really um, mandatory almost surely for the next framework program. So at the moment, what is done is really some kind of monitoring of the situation to try and and really prepare people for that and also to also identify what are the real needs to make this a reality, not just a, uh, an injunction, which uh, would not be good. So this is the, where we are in terms of a, a position, decision which has been made by the European Commission. Now, concerning the diversity of the scientific community, I think maybe that's something, uh, you are a huge community which already has its uh, very fine structure, which is of course very interesting, and I'm sure you sometimes you have some debates which uh, relate to that. But if you are in the position which uh, I have uh, in the European Research Council, when you put together mathematicians, physicists, uh, chemists, biologists, uh, historians, uh, archaeologists, uh, uh, economists, all kinds, uh, all, all disciplines, you realize that what is a critical mass can be very different. Uh, the dependence on networks of uh, gathering information uh, or maybe working alone uh, is hugely different. You also have the very diverse attitude towards uh, publications because uh, many disciplines uh, connected to yours, uh, pu uh, publication alone is quite seldom. Most of the publications involve a large number of people because uh, to produce the, the result, you need uh, many people uh, involved. So, of course, the, this has a very uh, critical um, influence on how you can practice open science because, uh, um, of course, uh, the publications, they have uh, several functions. One of them, the obvious one, is to uh, make the knowledge available to a larger community, but also it plays a very important role in the career of people because the way you judge whether people are performant or not is based on uh, how they publish, how they, uh, you can recognize their activities. So I think it makes uh, then the discussion about open science, how you share, how you, uh, whether you own something or you don't own it, or in which way you own it, uh, quite a critical question which has, which was much beyond just sharing. So this is uh, the, the point I want to make. And uh, this, therefore, one day I was confronted with, uh, with um, I was forced to give uh, in four words what could be the, the policy of ERC. And um, we, my response to that was four words, which were 
respect diversity and involve communities, which uh, to mean by this that if you don't, if you are not aware of the huge diversity which is in front of you, you are going to miss something. And the people who really know are the people from the community. So if you want to decide from the top something, uh, you have a good chance that you are going to miss the, the very important point. And my final point uh, has to do, as I said, with the fact that uh, to discuss open science uh, is necessarily a complex thing because uh, you cannot ignore that there is uh, an economic sector which is under it, uh, underpinning it, and uh, also that the whole issue is to also position the production and the dissemination of science towards a much broader public. And of course, um, there are definitely some areas where contribution by the general public is uh, very, very important, very significant, and corresponds to a fantastic group of ambassadors. I mean, astronomy is one of them, but also, you know, in, in many, in, our, in medicine, a number of people have really been extremely appreciative of the input coming from patients. So I think, uh, and therefore it means it's quite complicated, because how do you uh, organize this uh, interface? Um, because they are the professional people and the people who are not professional, but very committed and still very knowledgeable. So how do you make, uh, how do you organize yourself to show your respect for the, the knowledge which is produced, but still for the professional people, you have to organize it yourself at a different level. This is basically what I want to say, as, which is more or less an introduction to a debate rather than a statement. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, sure. Yeah. Bar Barbara can go. I don't know how to use this. I think it's on. Is it on? Yes. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit uh, from my own point of view and experience, which is I, uh, I, the point uh, by Jean-Pierre Bourguignon about great diversity is well taken, but as a seismologist and as a global seismologist, uh, in my view of the world, there is really two categories of data. That's what I will start with. First of all, the raw data, which are directly collected in the field, and this can be, for example, seismograms in seismology, so the waveforms, or any other time series or data collected at some particular geographical point, if we are talking about geophysical or geo, geosciences in general. And then the second category is the data produced as a consequence of research, and these are process data, so secondary observables, such as, again, drawing from the example of seismology, travel times of seismic phases, maps of surface wave group velocities, and such. And then also under that same category, I would put the um, result of modeling, so the models and also the computer codes developed for modeling. And I think these are two different categories that perhaps deserve slightly different um, uh, kind of consideration. And uh, so in the first category, uh, Again, in my corner of the universe, it is absolutely essential for raw data to be open because science uh, that can be done with data collected by only an individual institution, an individual country, is generally very limited. An individual group can only contribute a portion of what is needed to really advance the science. A very standard example, of, uh, of course very classical, is again f drawing from my um, discipline is earthquake location. You can earth locate an earthquake with one seismogram, but you're not going to do that very precisely. If you have a network of stations, you can do much better, and if the network of stations crosses a political boundary, you'd better co coordinate uh, the exchange of data to get a good location. Uh, the same data set, in addition, can be often used for different research purposes, in particular different purposes from those that were originally considered when designing the experiment. So you also can gain uh, much more if you uh, open the data to other, other types of analysis. And so this is a, really a case where the whole is better than the sum of the parts. Um, of course, there are important conditions to be made, to be met, and uh, it requires a lot of effort. You have to standardize. You have to standardize formats in which uh, data are uh, being exchanged, otherwise it's a, it's a big mess. You have, for this, you have to provide accurate metadata, which is a lot of work, and is, uh, uh, it takes uh, significant effort from a community to come up with, uh, with the right uh, meta metadata. Uh, you have to have readily accessible archives, uh, which, of course, um, requires significant resources. 
And uh, I, I would say, for example, in seismology, we have been organized very well already for the last 30 years. We have open data, data archives that are linked together uh, through the internet. But in the current political situation, you start asking the question, is that going to be possible going forward if uh, you know, political boundaries start uh, putting some, um, you know, um, some conditions on, on these data exchanges. There's also another aspect, which is the ethical attitude of the community. Um, you have to address the concern about the data producers, uh, which is the time and effort uh, spent on producing the data. So providing appropriate attribution, uh, paying at attention to not step over the research program of the group that has produced the data. So not do the same, or not try to do the same to, to, uh, to do it faster than they can because they're spending so much time just acquiring the data. And um, of course you can build in safeguards, uh, as uh, Professor Vorguignon already said, uh, by setting some moratorium in opening the data, but you also don't want to have them too, uh, too strict or too long um, to, to keep uh, the timeliness. Uh, uh, now, um, in terms of process data and computer codes, I, uh, I am very favorable to openness, but I will say that this also requires resources. It requires resources perhaps uh, even more so, um, because it, it, really, um, it really targets individual groups that usually have, uh, have resources to do the research, but usually don't have the resources for an, an extra person to, um, to, to, to uh, kind of uh, reformat whatever they have to, to be, accept, to be um, uh, comprehensible and to provide the support for other users to do this. So I think uh, basically these are the, the challenges that I wanted to bring up. Great, thank you. So uh, next we'll have the uh, Grace Baines offering us the point of view of the, the publishers. Uh, should be yours. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know about a debate. I think you might find that the panel are mostly in violent agreement um, about this issue um, from the comments I've heard so far. Um, what I would really like to, to argue, I think, is that open data and open science is a, are, are great things. They're great for the advancement of research. They're great for society as a whole. And uh, when my slides come up, I can give you some evidence as to why, but I'm going to keep going. Oh, just click. Okay. User error. Okay, here we go. Um, right. Um, so, why is, is sharing data in particular a good thing? For researchers themselves, it can really help increase visibility of their research. Um, it can also encourage reuse, which, as we've just heard, can be a good thing and some, can sometimes be a challenging thing, especially if you haven't finished using that data yourself. For funders, it can really increase the investment on research, um, of re uh, return on investment for research. So making sure that the same research isn't done twice, that the, the benefits are maximised. It increases the chance of reproducibility and for people to reuse and reproduce those results and transparency about how those results were gathered. It's good practice. And another benefit for individual researchers is we have, um, there is evidence that sharing data and linking to data increases readership and citations of their research as well. So lots of reasons why it's a good thing. So for a moment, I'm going to paint you a picture of a open data utopia where open data touches every stage of the research process from the moment a researcher starts thinking about applying for a grant and designing a study um, and producing a data management plan at that point to applying for funding and working with funders and potentially with publishers to register experimental design at that stage so the results become an important part but actually the the really important thing is is the experimental design itself collecting and managing that data using good processes and potentially open lab notebooks all the way through the process with an understanding about how you're going to store it and how you're going to share it 
and imagine a world where we could share our data as we went along rather than waiting until we're publishing research. Peer review of data is a really interesting question and not one I think as a global community we've solved. And of course there is publishing of data and the findings from data. And increasingly as a publisher we're, we're seeing interest in publications that actually describe the data itself. And then once that article is published or once that data is published making it really discoverable, a world where you can really find data because the metadata is really good, because it's really discoverable. And it's really easy to visualize because there are great tools to help you do that. And that data is not just used once, <clears throat> but is reused and reproduced. Do I believe that this world it would be a good thing? Yes, I do. Do I believe we are going to get there in three years? No. Do I think we will get there 100% in five, ten years? No. So what I'd like to argue is that we should be striving for this, but we should be taking a pragmatic approach. We should be understanding that some data isn't appropriate to be shared, that we should be an, as open as we can whenever we can. But being dogmatic about aiming for 100% open science and open data um, we will end up disappointed and we won't make the progress we could make um, if we start taking the steps we can now. And then finally, I would just like to share some of the things that we've learned and learned from the research of others about the importance of removing barriers for making data sharing work. So we know that researchers say they want to share their data they understand the reasons for doing it. And I'm, I'm aware presenting to a group of researchers that actually I should draw to your attention that this draws on three studies. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the percentages are not all com um, comparing the same data set. Um, they are very willing to share their data and they say they are, but in actual fact, only about half of researchers are actually sharing their data at the moment. And the most common ways they do that are supplementary information of, in journal articles, which sometimes is open but sometimes not, and email. Why aren't they sharing? Well, because they have challenges, because they have questions. They're not sure about copyright and licensing. Who has the copyright? Can they make their data open access? What data standards should they use? What does their funder require and how can they comply? It takes time. It takes time to do metadata well. They don't know where to store it or share it. And they don't know how to meet the costs if there are costs of doing that. And that could be storage costs or it could be curation costs as we've heard. I believe that we can overcome these barriers and we can provide incentives to share data but in order to do that, the research community, funders, governments, institutions, and publishers, and researchers themselves need to work together and find pragmatic solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last presentation will be Helen Glaes. So um, I'm, um, I'm going to be the one who um, maybe disagrees with the, uh, the points of view that have been given by my colleagues so far. But I should put a caveat on this um, because otherwise I might leave a, need a bodyguard to leave the room. Because um, um, as anybody who looks at my CV will know, I am a great advocate of open science and open data. But in the interest of a debate, I think we also need to look at some of the arguments that have been put forward by those people who don't believe that open science is a good thing, and they don't believe that sharing their data is the way to go. And there are a number of justifications for this. So, for example, um, one of the key issues is that um, we, we hear a lot about the need to actually put the data in the public domain because it's been paid for by the public. But there is also the issue of government accountability about what pe they've actually done with people's money. They've actually spent money and resources on management of the data, making that data actually available. So there is this issue of the efficient use of taxpayers' money. 
And the only way to do that is to charge for some of this data through and to allow cost recovery. There are also some arguments that say that there is a need for generating revenue from publishing some of the data that my colleagues here on the panel have already advocated because some of the key activities are actually funded through this generation of revenue. So some organizations are dependent on the, this generation uh, of revenue, to, to getting in money through the sale of data and data products um, in order to fund further data generation to actually support the long-term dissemination and preservation of this data if the money runs out, what happens to the data? So this actually is a different perspective on perhaps the, the, the view that, that Grace in particular has just provided. But also charging for revenue allows some not-for-profit not organizations to continue their activities, to publish their journals, to support their researchers. So this is something else that's a little bit hidden in all of these arguments. But also there is the issue about the fact that a lot of the raw data that, that Barbara mentioned and the need to put the raw data out there, there's a question about how usable is that data for many of the end users? How many of them are actually looking for the raw data? How many of them are actually more interested in the, in the data products, the maps, the services? Because these additional management and processing of data to make this data use, usable again requires a massive input and resources but we also have to consider privacy and i had a conversation with one of my colleagues here yesterday over lunch in the audience about the realities of what the privacy um, issues around some types of data in particular medical data really means how much data is really actually in the in the public domain for example from medical studies and my colleagues here have already referred to this as well for a variety of reasons this data and some of the outcomes of this research cannot be in the public domain so this there is no scope for for open research that's dealing with some types of data that have clear privacy issues around them, whether it be medical data or information about where people live or their consumption of particular energy types. But that's only one aspect. I also want to talk about the researcher. I want to talk about the guy in the field. What does he tell me? I actually work for a, for a repository in the UK and we deal with researchers who are actually submitting their data and they, they have a range of reasons why they don't want to put their data in a, in a certified repository, why they don't want to share their data with other people. They feel they've invested an awful lot of resources collecting that data and they actually develop a very strong sense of attachment to, to their data. And so they develop this syndrome which Leslie Wyborn here in the audience calls data mining. It is mine, you can't have it. They're also concerned about inappropriate secondary use of their data, somebody taking their data and using it in a way that they do not feel is appropriate. And again, that causes an issue. They become very, very concerned about whether somebody's making use of their data and they somehow end up liable for some aspect of the research that's been done. But I think we also have to bear in mind another perspective for the researcher. All of them are um, in need of a job, they need to work, they need to have future research proposals. So they actually see that their data is part of this currency for them to support their future research. They want to hold on to their data and not share it with someone else so that they have that material for their future funding proposal that nobody else has. But there is also this concept of the data parasite. And I know there's been a lot of discussion in the media, particularly in the medical domain, about whether this is a real phenomenon or not. So I'd like to introduce you to Sucky. <coughs> Sucky is the research parasite who um, lives in the Twitter sphere. And this um, has been propagated quite extensively recently. And it is a, an idea that researchers are share, scared of sharing their data because they're terrified that their data will be stolen from them. They will, know, they will not know how far it's gone, who's using it, and worse still, other people will get credit for what was their research in the start. 
I also want to just quickly give some reflections based on this topic about some of the things I've heard at EGU this week. I don't know if Vim Hugo is in the audience at the moment, but apologies to him because I've just plagiarised part of his excellent talk, which he gave on Monday. But I think it's very relevant to this great debate, and I wanted to, to bring this particular um, observation that Vim made during his talk on Monday which is that open science doesn't necessarily mean better policy or better decision making. Significant effort is actually needed to get from the data to the policy. And another issue is that science is conducted by the specialists, while de decision support is often done by the generalist. So, in reality, is open science the real conversation we should be having at this point in time? And I think Grace summarised it very well in her closing remarks, that the timeline for open science is still up for debate. Thank you very much. So here we have the both sides of the story. Um, the, 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 the first and, uh, uh, and the last um, um, talks kind of uh, oppose, I guess, uh, in a way. So we uh, uh, we have the full range. I, I want to start first with with ownership. I mean, you mentioned uh, ownership of the data, and uh, we want to respect the diversity of, of practices ac across disciplines, and we want to respect the the, the, the data generators um, as a process uh, funded by uh, public uh, money um, for um, uh, public service. Who does ultimately uh, own the, the research data that, that uh, researchers generate? I think depending on the, on the context and the, on the countries, uh, the, the attitude towards uh, um, data and towards uh, actually uh, ownership of, uh, of results uh, varies a lot. I mean, this is uh, critically uh, encapsulated into the regulations concerning IP, for example, for, uh, and, and of course uh, the, the different countries have different philosophies and different uh, attitude. So therefore we, uh, I mean, this is one thing which immediately comes to, uh, cannot be ignored, and because there is a legal framework in which things are, are done, uh, uh, or, and, and they are done quite often differently. So that's one, one thing. Then um, besides that, of course, the condition through which the data are, are produced uh, can vary enormously because sometimes it's really um, very personal work. Most of the time it's not. It's really a big network of people, people with different position in the uh, hierarchical ladder, I mean, from researchers, technicians, even uh, uh, I mean, all, all kinds of people can be mobilized for that, and, and therefore, uh, I mean, the, if you want to go from the data to the people who produce them, it can be a quite complex uh, process if you want to monitor it uh, carefully. Um, so, so this is uh, something which, uh, again, the only way you can deal with it in a proper way is by, um, for, for basically for each sector in which you look at that, to look at the reality, and the reality can be very diverse. I'm sorry I'm not uh, giving simple answers, but unfortunately... I don't think there is a one-fits-all answer in, in, on this issue. Uh, since, we're, again, I think it's since we're talking about ownership, I, uh, I wanted to, to uh, rebound on, on, on what you said about uh, you know, reselling the data. That comment surprised me because uh, I have... Uh, I spent part of my time in the U.S. and I have uh, worked with the U.S. Geological Survey who uh, funds a lot of uh, seismic networks and in fact we're not allowed to resell the data because the argument is this was already paid by the, uh, the taxpayer so this would be double taxation. So uh, I think there is this, uh, this argument. Do you want me to come back on that? So, sure, sure. Um, I think there's, 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 we shouldn't forget that, uh, that I agree with you in most instances there is a mandate for um, free and open access to data that's funded by public money, but I think we also shouldn't forget that there are certain instances where governments do actually uh, legitimise the sale of data for the purposes of cost recovery. So, um, you know, I can use the example of the Ordnance Survey in the UK who produce data products. They charge for those products and they're charging for those data products. So I think there still is a culture of charging for some things. Um, 
I'd, I'd like to add to that and actually come back to your first question and afterwards as well. Um, I think you've hit on a very important point there, Helen, which is there's a difference between the raw data itself and its interpretation or other value that is added. And my argument would be that it's perfectly reasonable to charge for access to data or interpretations of data where value has been added. And I don't think that's inconsistent with an open science viewpoint. And actually, I believe the Ordnance Survey have made the original data set open, but you still have to pay for their maps, for example, because that's an interpretation of the data. To come back on the ownership question, and this is, you know, really does vary around the world. In, in the US, for example, where research is federally funded or you work for a federally funded institution, data is public domain. And, and there is no copyright at all. It's completely waived. In other countries, there are differing views on that. But here, I think the question becomes really import important to answer about licensing of data. And that's where things like Creative Commons licenses are very helpful. Many people believe that CC0, which is a complete waiver, Creative Commons 0, um, should be applied to data when it's facts. But the Creative Commons Attribution Licence is another alternative, and that requires at least the author of the work to be attributed and to be credited. So this concern about their work being stolen may still occur, but it, it shouldn't. And there are also non-commercial versions of those licenses which allow lots of reuse and redistribution and make that really simple and clear for the end user, but still retain the right for those commercial instances where that's appropriate. Okay, so um, on the question of ownership, um, you, 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 uh, you mentioned some facts that only, only half of the of the researchers share data. So that's either a glass half full or half empty, depending on which side of the argument we're on. But he also points that not everybody has the same definition of ownership. Some see it as, a, as you mentioned, CC0, and some see it as uh, their own personal uh, product. Um, is, there, is there something we can, we can do to, um, to, to change this uh, mindset? I mean, um, to, to um, educate the next generation of researchers so that they have a more uh, informed or updated view of ownership? Can I, can I get more um, I mean, I think one of the key things is that um, we need to actually encourage researchers to want to share their data, whether we're talking about the raw data or we're talking about the data products and get away from this data mining sense. And, and the way to do that is to give them an incentive for sharing their data and, and so being able to cite their data and making use of mechanisms for publishing their data as a, a, an acknowledged research output is a clear incentive for people to actually share their data, publish their data because if someone else takes their data set and they make some groundbreaking discovery but their data has been properly cited, it does mean that they get credit for being part of that discovery. And so I think that's an important thing and it, because it will encourage even the most stalwart um, researcher that there's benefit, there's career benefit for them to be had. If I can just... <laughs> if I can just add a, a little observations uh, uh, that I have made is that those researchers that share their data products, now we're talking about the data products, actually are much more popular in the community and, uh, you know, gain uh, actually recognition in that fashion. So on one side we have the, the benefits of career uh, advantage, more citation, more visibility. Um, but um, uh, on the other side, uh, Jean-Pierre mentions there is a, an economic disruption here potentially, uh, that also the funders are um, um, concerned or aware of, is that, is that a, a, an issue? Well, 
I think you want us to, to, to really be very clear on this. Uh, as I said, I mean, it was really a policy decision on the side of the European Commission to, to really make the, um, make the um, articles, I mean, the results of the research uh, available uh, mandatory. Uh, so this is uh, the open access uh, issue. Now, the question of uh, open data, uh, I think Barbara very uh, appropriately made the difference between the raw data and also the uh, data which have been uh, transformed or improved or really, um, which really uh, meant uh, another layer of, uh, of uh, scientific work on them. And of course, there, um, you, you don't want that this uh, final product, I mean the, the, the data which are produced after this transformation, are considered as just um, uh, something where the, the contribution, this layer, is totally forgotten. And of course to identify this uh, layer is, is highly non-trivial because who has contributed to, to creating this new layer is highly non-trivial because part of it is uh, some, uh, some uh, modeling tools, uh, part of it is really some uh, using some models or some tools that you ap apply to a certain, uh, con a certain group of uh, raw data. But this uh, can very often need that you have to clean the data, which is something which could be extremely cumbersome, costly uh, in terms of uh, energy, also in terms of uh, requires a lot of competence. And, and so, um, I mean, this transformation, um, uh, people who contribute to it don't want to be forgotten. And again, the people who will contribute to that will probably be uh, quite a different, uh, I mean, a very a broad group of people, people who are really whose competence is uh, typically uh, computational, some other people whose competence is very directly uh, connected to the knowledge which is, uh, the, I mean, which is uh, encapsulated in the, in the data. And so it means that uh, the, 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 the complexity of the situation is there and therefore when you want to acknowledge things properly, uh, it becomes a really very difficult thing and particularly if you want to, it's the same as uh, for food safety. I mean, if you really want to know exactly uh, how the, the food has been processed, it's a, it's a complicated process. So, but this is indispensable that this happens, but to, to make this happen in a non-bureaucratic way and not something which actually, uh, because you want to do it, uh, but, but the to do it in the right way uh, is not becoming for researchers a, a nightmare, is, is something which requires a lot of thought. Now the final point which had to do with the uh, economical dimension is um, a number of uh, publishers or even new companies uh, appearing, uh, some of the big publishers are very focused on that, want also to to help the researchers to really improve their data. So they really want to, uh, to, they are very interested in data because they think that this is a new market which for them will be a, a typical place where the added value will be considerable because they can really develop um, quite substantial platforms, comprehensive platforms with a lot of competence and, uh, and these will be new products that um, individual researchers or small groups of researchers will not be able to compete with and therefore they will, that will be a place where they will be indispensable and then for them of course it's a, anytime you're indispensable it's a good, good place to, to make money and in some sense uh, it's not illegitimate but there must be limits to that so. Great. That's a perfect point for me to come in, I think. Um, so speaking as a, as a publisher and um, working for a commercial publisher at that, um, I absolutely do want to be indispensable to you. Um, so we are very interested in how we can add value on data and how publishers with the infrastructure that we have, with the editorial expertise that we have, with the global reach that we have, can add value. What at Springer Nature we are very clear we do not want to do is to own your data. We want to help you improve your data, help you share it, add value to it, help you discover other data, but we're not trying to take your data from you. Um, so absolutely I think there is, a, you know, we like to think there is a role for publishers in, in this, but wall gardens are not, certainly from Springer Nature's perspective, where we're trying to get to. To, to, to pick up, can I pick up on a couple of things there um, which kind of relate to that? So costs, there are very real costs in creating good data, marking it up well, 
Um, I mean, Helen knows this, I'm sure, better than anybody else sitting here. Um, and the long-term preservation as well of that data and ensuring that it's discoverable now and usable now, but it's also there in 10, 15 years' time. And I think as a community, we really need to look at those costs um, and see the benefits in the same way that we have increasingly done with open access publication and have a real discussion about how we make that a viable part of the research process. And then the last thing I'd like to say is on um, data generated perhaps by commercial groups or um, where there is a commercialization opportunity. And in those instances, that's where I would argue again for pragmatism. And I would say sharing what can be shared or sharing for non-commercial use is better than not sharing at all. Thank you. Um, so there is, there is a little bit of a thread here between the ownership and, and Helen, you were saying we should train and, and, and teach the next generation of uh, scientists to share as much as possible in pragmatic terms. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for, for uh, highlight, highlighting that it is not the publisher's uh, 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 objective to, to own the data, but um, here there is a, uh, um, a need to maybe train the, the next generation of uh, researchers on exactly what are the rules of engagement when it comes to uh, letting their data go. When do they own it, who owns it, and, and how they get attribution back for their effort. Um, whose responsibility would it be ultimately to make sure that that knowledge and training is inserted into the standard workflow of, of the next generation of scientists? I mean, I think, I think there is a recognition now that there is a, a need to train the next generation of scientists um, uh, in data management techniques, and there is a lot of discussion at the moment around how that becomes embedded in the education process. And actually, I think this is, this is where EGU has a role, for example, in, the, in their short course programs, because you know, that is an opportunity to, to, to educate the next generation of researchers. But I actually think it goes back earlier than sort of, you know, the, the undergraduate. I think we need to actually be making, you know, school children understand, you know, the implications of putting data out out there into the into the public domain and you know the benefits of of what is done in terms of sharing research data so that it becomes part of the education process from quite early on and so it becomes quite fundamental so I'll give you a perfect example um, I'm aware of the fact that um, secondary school education in the UK now there is a module in their computer studies course that actually directly addresses metadata and the importance of metadata gathering if they're collecting data as part of their studies in their scientific activities. So I think we need to promote that more. I think that's where the focus needs to start. It almost needs to become second nature to them. And that's how we will make sure that future generations of researchers understand the importance of good data management, being able to share their data, understanding the implications, but also understanding the benefits of it as well. Um, I take a point um, that um, I'm actually surprised that you would like to go that far down the, the food chain. Um, but um, although societies like EGU maybe hold that responsibility, are we not jumping uh, uh, over the responsibility of the institutions and the graduate schools where the actual next generation is recruited? I mean, uh, don't they have a responsibility to officialize, certify training like this? After all, uh, uh, some of these uh, open science processes, they're not just done for ethical reasons, there is a reproducibility angle in there, and, and if we uh, sacrifice on that, then, then what is the long-term cost? I mean, don't, don't you think graduate schools have some kind of responsibility on this? Well, maybe not only graduate school, but just more generally the senior uh, researchers that, uh, you know, have already some experience and maybe uh, a broader view of, of, of the whole uh, problem should uh, um, make sure that the younger generations are sensitized to the fact that they need to also fight for this, uh, for, for the organization of this, because it's not just, you know, I want to give my data, etc. There has to be an infrastructure. And so you have to, uh, in order for an infrastructure to exist, the community has to uh, get organized 
and get the funding for it. And uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, maybe a generation ago this happened, but it has to be redone, uh, you know, every 10 or 20 years, uh, the same issues. Uh, I mean, again, I'm talking from the point of view of seismological uh, community, which uh, got organized 30 years ago, but uh, the younger generation think it's um, automatic that they get the data, you know, they sit at their computer and they get the data, but it is not automatic at all. You have to keep, uh, uh, keep working on it, improving, uh, you know, improving the, um, the technology uh, in, and um, fighting for the funding to be able to organize because the infrastructure is very important. So, um, the Center for Open Science in the US, uh, which, well, we can guess where their uh, point of view lies, they published um, a couple of studies over the last 18 months, I believe. One was on psychology and one was on uh, cancer biology. And uh, their argument is that the lack of transparency and openness of the building blocks that lead to certain studies and publications, like the data and, and the underlying work, um, reduces the reproducibility of those uh, studies. Um, and especially in cancer biology, the, the consequences, um, um, well, you can imagine. Um, but still, let's look at, uh, if we're going to add a whole layer of training at um, responsi training responsibilities for graduate schools and, 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 and institutions, their argument would be, well, the curriculum is already booked. Uh, so how do we prioritize um, this new set of skills that need to be added in the digital age, right, and, and big data and, and data handling, how do we add that layer of skills in an already, and how do we prioritize it, how do we change the mindset of the graduate schools and the institutions to, uh, to put priority on that? Well, again, it depends on the community. I think in geosciences, and certainly in geophysics, it's, uh, it's already in the mindset uh, in, in most places. And I don't think you need to add a layer. You, you just need to, to uh, for you know, more senior, pe senior um, members of the community to bring in the younger, uh, the younger generation to involve them in the, com in the community meetings, in the, uh, in the um, uh, committees, you know, that, uh, that work to, to discuss all the, these issues and to make them participate early on. I don't think you need to add a, a formal layer of instruction. It's more happening, you know, in the field. So it's the role, it's the role of the supervisors. That's where it lies. If you, if you have a PhD, it is your role to, to make sure that uh, these kind of best practices are in, included in the, in, the, in the workflow. But I, if I can just comment on that, I, I think uh, I, I absolutely agree with Barbara. I think certainly in, in my domain, um, there is already this awareness that you know, this is part of the education process. And so it, it, you're absolutely right. I don't think we need to talk about adding another layer. And I think if you look at a lot of the universities, certainly in the UK, there are a number of courses springing up, both at, at graduate and postdoctoral level, that are available to, to, the, to, the, to the student, to the early career scientist as well, that actually are directly readily available to them. So there's no need for an extra layer. I think, I think there is an awareness that this is an important part of the education process now. Right. Yeah, just to mention, um, of course, this is a typical case where a community recognizes that this kind of uh, competence, this kind of uh, knowledge is uh, just uh, a, a component of the absolutely necessary knowledge for, for um, the next generation. The difficulty comes in uh, communities where the use of uh, large uh, set of data uh, is a paradigm shift in the practice of, uh, of the work. And the typical community of this sort is historians, where definitely at this moment there are really uh, quite uh, serious debates where some historians are trying to uh, approach a number of uh, historical uh, issues uh, on, uh, based on the quite massive use of data, um, when some others consider this as some kind of a um, well, devaluation of the work of the historians who have to rely more on uh, really looking at archives and uh, things like this without uh, creating new set of, uh, 
of uh, archives in some sense because you collect them in a very different way. And so, uh, of course, for the communities which are, for which this um, um, eruption of, uh, of uh, the, uh, this data-based approach is coming, um, of course, it's much more complicated because then there is, the consensus is not that there and then it's not even, for some people, they even claim that uh, there will not be a consensus. That is, there will be different ways of doing things and there will be different schools and different approaches. So I think uh, if you look at a more, take a more global uh, view, then of course there are communities which are already, uh, already in this uh, mindset and they are already taking the necessary step, that is both uh, training people properly, recognizing new professions, uh, that new professions are needed to develop the work and so on, and some others where really the, this uh, paradigm change is just uh, on, on underway and uh, the question is whether it's just uh, you wait long enough and this will be done or whether there will still be people who will claim that uh, this is not the right way of doing uh, your profession. So I think uh, definitely in the different domains of knowledge you, you do witness uh, situations like this where clearly some, some cases are just uh, things are already done in some way which means a lot of work, a lot of uh, uh, new means and new, new professions to be recognized and so on, but this is uh, basically done. And some others where clearly the, there is still a, a serious debate about that. Um, Can I just quickly sure. comment on that because there was a really good paper given here early this week um, from um, somebody representing the natural history collections and I just wanted to give an example of what you were talking about and, and the figures that were given were that only 10% of natural history uh, samples are actually available to, to, uh, to wider research. About 90% of them are currently still in analog form and have not in any way been documented or digitized even at the meta data level. So actually, if certainly for people who are wanting to deal with the natural um, uh, history collections, there is still a long, long way to go. So I think your point is absolutely right, that it does very much demand, depend on the community. Thank you, uh, Helen. Um, we should open the floor for questions, and I'm going to ask uh, if you have questions to the panel to just walk to the, uh, to the uh, microphones. Um, yes. Um, my name is Werner Kutsch. I'm a director of a research infrastructure that has a very open uh, data policy and I want to come back to the data citation because I really think that this is a key. And uh, Grace, your vision was from my point of view incomplete because it has not the system of tracking the data citations. And my vision is that a young scientist or a mid-term career scientist in, let's say, 20 years is applying and has a, not only an H index but also a D index and can show that his or her data are used or have been used in a 10 nature paper and the, and the organization that is hiring these persons is taking this as the same value as the five nature paper Saki has, has written by, by taking the data. And I think that's quite, that's crucial to have this system. And I want to ask you, is uh, nature part of developing this kind of data citation system and tracking system? Thank you, that's a, an excellent question. And I think that's a, that's a case of Familiarity leads to um, oversight and mentioning in, in something very, very important because I, we share your view absolutely that data citation is key and critical to both providing credit, tracking, tracking impact and linking the research community um, and research results together. So we are actively involved in how we can promote data citation. Um, we last year introduced a group of journal data policies which make our data policies very simple and those include encouraging data citation through to mandating data citation and data sharing. There are lots of ways to cite data but DOIs, you can easily get a DOI for data which makes it just as citable and we would certainly encourage researchers to be citing their data and citing others' data in their 
research publications and would also encourage funders to be considering data, data publication or data release as something that should be considered for credit as much as a publication. Can I just quickly come back on that because um, there is an organisation called the Co Co and I've got to get this right, the Coalition, Coalition on Publishing Data from Earth System Science, COPDES, which brings together the data repositories and a number of the publishers, and I believe Springer is one of them. Stringer and Nature as well. And this is about addressing exactly the issues that Grace has, uh, has just uh, highlighted. So there is a recognition for this need for the publishers to come together with the repositories and those people dealing with day-to-day -day data management tasks. I'll, I'll start with the question. Uh, we are talking about open data. I think we should also talk about uh, open results, open papers. So my question is, um, why on most scientific journals I have to pay 40 euros to download a paper and how much of this money is going to the people who wrote the paper? <laughs> right. Uh, maybe it's a bit provocative, but... Um, <laughs> and so my, my background is scientific, I'm coming from the scientific community and my career path has gone into the insurance business. I work in the insurance in a scientific team and our job is to make sure that the decision that involve hundreds of millions of pounds about weather related risk are not taken by actuaries but they are taken by scientists. And for this point, it's crucial that the data that the science produced, the results, are available in the easiest possible way to the industry. Because I think that's the scope of the science, to make the world better. So who would like to give the 30 second answer to where does the money go? <laughs> I think I better take that one. And Helen, it might be me that needs the bodyguard on the way out. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I would say two things. I think I would say that just in the same way that we have acknowledged that there are real costs associated with curating, preserving data, there are very definitely real costs associated with making publications discoverable, easily readable, um, facilitating the peer review process, and those costs do need to be recovered, and they need to be recovered in some way, and there's multiple ways you can do that, and paying per article is one way. The, the model that Springer Nature is increasingly pursuing is asking researchers to consider the cost of publication as part of the research process, or their funders or institutions, so that they can be free to the end, end user. Hello? Maybe the comment I want to make, uh, I'm a mathematician and the mathematical community is one uh, of those who is uh, most resistant to, to the, uh, the, the gold model of uh, publication with APCs. And um, one reason is uh, it's true that uh, all, in all my career, I ne if I asked a researcher to, to give me uh, an article he has just been produced, I, I get it immediately. There is no problem to ac accessing articles. I just ask and I get it. Uh, in other disciplines, I understand this is not necessarily the case. That is, people want sometimes to keep things in a way which is more controlled. So I think, uh, again, we are facing a situation where what you describe as uh, your legitimate uh, request is uh, considered fully legitimate some places, uh, less legitimate other places. And um, definitely, I think we, we need to, and the, the key question you were asking, is actually what is the value of the service which is provided by the people who publish. And there is definitely a cost. I, I was um, director of an institute which was producing a journal, and so I knew exactly how much it cost to produce the, the journal. And the journal, of course, there were different uh, parts in it uh, which were 
which were actually uh, of different nature, uh, but uh, it's true that to produce a, a journal of a certain uh, quality uh, requires some, some cost. But then uh, the, the question is whether the, what is in the end asked as payment uh, is in line with the real cost. So that's the key issue, of course, there. And, and then uh, the same will happen with the, with the data. If the data, if the service provided to improve the data is, uh, is uh, paid at the right price or not the right price, so there will be room for a real study of what is the added value and to measure this as accurately as possible. I think the original question was how many of the $40 go to the uh, author, but I think that's a question bigger than this debate. Next question. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Dirk Fleischer. I'm uh, managing uh, infrastructure for marine science. And uh, I want to pick up on Helen's uh, Saki uh, friend uh, with the question, if we are really open and transparent, giving out our ideas with timestamps in the internet openly visible, it is very easy to track down that somebody stole an idea, stole data. But what we are right now missing is in the, in the science world, if somebody is doing this and publishing a paper, usually all his people who know him and know this, the, this fact, they start closing down. In the real world, we call the police and tell them, okay, get the thief and uh, put him into prison. But uh, we don't do that in science. We start to uh, do our own business and uh, close down. Why is it so rare that uh, people who have done something like this uh, have, not, have to withdraw their articles and uh, are pointed at. I, 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 see this, I hear the story very often, but I don't see uh, visible reactions to that. I, I suppose really that's a question for Grace as well, because I think what we're talking about is, is effectively data plagiarism. You know, people reusing other people's data without giving them sufficient credit. And when this is, um, you know, visible, I think this comes back to Barbara's point, you know, there is a certain level of community acceptance and, you know, what is not acceptable in a community. So I think Dirk's right. When people recognize this is happening, you know, they do become sort of ostracized a little bit from their community. But I think maybe this is a question for Grace of, you know, do the, do the publishers plan or do they have a process whereby, you know, if data's, um, you know, if it's clear that data has been taken from one author and used by another without appropriate citation, will the journals in the future maybe deal with that in the same way that they use, do with academic plagiarism right now? Such a good question. I, I think that the research community is actually still struggling with um, plagiarism of research articles and of um, the results of research and, and cross um, community initiatives which like crosscheck looking at plagiarism are making real strides there but there is a way to go and unfortunately it does still happen. Actually I, I think that this is not just a publisher responsibility and certainly you know when we unfortunately as we sometimes do have to retract an article more often than not, it is the author or the institution who, in the end, retracts the, the article. We will bring what we found to their attention. We will express concern. But the institution often needs to investigate that allegation of plagiarism or other misconduct. And then the journal will co cooperate with them. That's not to say that journals don't have a responsibility. I think they absolutely do. And we do retract articles um, as the publisher or the editor when we need to. But it's very definitely a shared responsibility. So is it a case that uh, the fear of plagiarism or data sucking or thieving uh, is actually bigger than the, the reality? Uh, isn't there a, a case of self-policing? Uh, those that the plagiarize and thieve, they get a one strike out yeah, I think I, I, I totally agree with, with Grace's comment, actually, that I think there has to be some self-regulation within the community. You cannot be entirely looking to the publishers because not all data finds its way into, da into publications anyway. So, you know, it, it, data can be reused in other data products. People actually 
bring together data from multiple sources to create new data products. So there, you know, and the publishers are not actually even involved in that process, certainly not until the stage that there is a scientific paper delivered at some point. So I think there is a need for self-regulation, but maybe we need to start be having, starting to have a conversation about the unacceptability of data plagiarism, of actually taking someone else's data without giving them due credit and just making it an unacceptable practice. Great, let's take another question from the floor. Yes, thank you. My name is Dietrich Feist. Um, I want to go back to Werner Kutsch's question about tracking the use of data and uh, because I work, well, I work, I'm part of a network uh, that has been uh, putting the data into the open and we have used DOIs and everything uh, for quite a while. And I can assure you it's not as simple as just to put a DOI to your uh, data set um, because we have several dozen papers that have even cited our DOIs but still they are not tracked by any of the index uh, services. It's actually quite a long process uh, where you have to work with them intensively and it, uh, I spent about three months collecting the metadata that we need to submit to Thomson Reuters and get it in the right format uh, before they can even start doing that. So there's quite uh, a high, um, yeah, something you, yeah, quite an investment uh, to actually get your data tracked in the same way that you would get a journal publication tracked. And this is not an easy task. And I have to say right now, the only hard currency in getting your data attributed is to ask for co-authorship. That's the only thing that you can really rely on that it will be properly attributed to you. I think the only thing I want to, I would just like to say I agree, and, and I certainly wasn't attempting to trivialize or make sound simple something that is a shared problem we have to solve. Hi, so. I, I wanted to make uh, three remarks and eventually those remarks can be questions. The first one is uh, everybody is talking about data, but uh, data by itself is nothing if they are not used and if there is not the information to be used, so data contains information, but data as a digital number, when they are digital, have no value. The value is really on how you can uh, use the data, and this is a scientific responsibility. And the data are generally uh, collected, gathered, as a scientific initiative, where the community has to be organized in some communities like uh, seismology, astrophysics, or other, those data are coming from large observational systems, large instruments, uh, around which the community is organized and has the responsibility uh, and want to have a responsibility of uh, data stewardship. And the data stewardship has to remain in the scientific community if we want the data to have a scientific content. So when we heard about technology or <clears throat> economical facilities to uh, keep the data, we have to remind that the data stewardship has to remain in the scientific community if we want the data to keep a scientific or a knowledgeable value. That's the first uh, remark. My second remark is about whether we need a layer, additional layer in training. I think what we need is really something to support the organization a part of a scientific community around the data that has a cost, that is a very long term perspective. Some communities have been organized for a very long time and they critically uh, rely on that and this organizational um, business is a very, very important uh, thing around the data more than infrastructures or everything. We need to have a community organized about the data stewardship and the data use. And finally, my last remark is about the property or not of the data, because uh, it depends on the research practice. Some research practice don't share the data because they don't need to do that, or they think they don't need to do that. And therefore, if we want to sensitize this, uh, or to have some incentive is really to demonstrate that there is a value in terms of research productions and new knowledge to be produced by sharing the data. 
Otherwise, there is no need to share the data in some communities because either the people don't rely on the data of others or they can produce good science without sharing the data. Can I so, ask you to conclude that's so that we can have the panel's reaction before the next question? Thank you. Um, anyone like to uh, reflect on that? Yes. So uh, I, I think I absolutely agree with you, of course, <laughs> on, on all these points. Uh, I, I, uh, certainly the first two points, the last, the last question really is how to do it, you know, how to convince uh, people that, uh, that in fact there is value added in, in sharing. Uh, in sharing. Um, I think that's, that's actually uh, a challenge. <laughs> that uh, because it only happens by example really so um, uh, the best way is to show that you can do some science better than if you are not sharing that's the only incentive that a scientist can understand <laughs> if they can produce results that they couldn't produce without using the data of others then this is the good incentive Let's take that for uh, after the debate. We do have several questions. If I can ask you to uh, really state your question in 30 seconds, all of four yep. of you, and then we'll have reactions before we conclude. Okay, I'm Robert Gurney, and I'm the chairman of the um, E-Infrastructure um, and Data Management Committee of the Belmont Forum, which is the top 26 funders, one of which is the European Commission, which we managed to persuade to become open. That, that it's clearly an issue of reproducibility. On, uh, on results. When things are open, then they are, um, you, people's behavior is different because they don't just select positive answers, which otherwise they only publish positive answers, and there's huge evidence in many fields of that. Beyond that, though, we should recognize the cost across these 26 funders who are moving to open data. It costs 5 to 10% of their turnover, and that means 5 to 10% fewer grants. Thank you. That's a good comment on, on transparency. Yes? I will go really quick. Uh, so, Alison Hefner, uh, University of Bremen, uh, Marum. So, I'm a marine biologist, but I'm also on the project management. So, this is a little bit different, but uh, this is the communicating science type of question. Uh, do you think that having open data, open science, will help close the gap between researchers and general public, allowing the public to become more involved? Or will it be like the WebMD effect in the United States, where everybody thinks that they're a physician because they saw it online? So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the previous speaker already stole part of my question, but uh, still, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm a great fan of open data. Uh, secondly, I understand that this debate here, according to what is written in the program, was about open data mainly, but I'm still a bit disappointed that uh, open science is reduced to just this aspect here. I think it should be much more than that. Open science seen as open data, that means we scientists sit in our castle and once in a while we open the doors and release our data and, and present it to the public. But in fact, open science, I think, should be much more than that. It should be a two-way uh, street. And uh, it's not only my definition. I actually just read it on the, on the Horizon 2020 webpage. The definition of open science there is really the co-production of knowledge, meaning that we do science together with society. We do the, uh, the science that society wants us to do, how they want us to do, with the results that they expect. And so it should be, it should be a dialogue and not just putting out data. And, and of course, it's, it's a lot of interesting and difficult questions that we are discussing here, but I think it's reducing really open science to, to a very, very, very small portion of what it actually should be. Can I, can I just quickly come back on that? Um, I, I just wanted to, to highlight the, the increasing role that I think citizen science is playing in a, in a multitude of fields where researchers are increasingly relying on the observations of the general public. And so this is closing the gap between the general public and the researcher in a number of fields. And so I think this does address at least one of your points. And I think it's something we should try and focus on going forward is the role of the citizen scientist. Before we continue, I just want to give the last gentleman a chance. Um, I'm Prasun Bhattacharya from KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. I just wanted to inform about, I was, it was a great debate what we are talking about open science. But first of all, I was just trying to understand, I mean, what science we are trying to make it open, firstly. Number two, what is the total volume of data, what, we, what we science produces as compared to what is produced by different governmental agencies. 
globally because that is one, at least is the one, I mean, there's just a fraction of the total data sets available about the current problems, especially when we say, talk in this forum of EGU. What concerns geosciences? I mean, you will be talking about the earthquake data. And I was more focusing on the water quality information, which is very scarce. I mean, different countries within the European Union, within the rest of the world, there's a great deal of di di differential handling of the data, different standards of analytical infrastructure, analytical trustworthiness. And so these are some, some of the global problems which we need to address when we talk about open data. For example, if I want to go to Nicaragua and take it up, um, understand the water, water, drinking water problems, how do we make use of this data? This is beyond the scope of our individual room-based research or our personalized research. It's basically how we focus more on the societal needs, especially within the framework of SDGs, how science is going to promote the SDG goals in different in, in these different objectives. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to close the, the floor, but uh, reactions by all means. So um, it seems open science is, is good for transparency, avoiding cherry picking of results. Surely if we want policy underpinned by science and facts, that's a, that's a good thing. And uh, the, uh, the other remark, can we bridge the gap between uh, uh, academia and, and society if we're that open and transparent? Well, that's a major challenge and it looks like um, it's uh, something to which uh, the scientific community as a whole has not uh, put enough uh, attention to and uh, probably not enough effort, um, except the efforts are, um, it's not so obvious how to develop them because definitely there are some areas where there are people who are already spontaneously uh, interested in, uh, in the topics and are actually producing uh, some, some knowledge in some way. And these people are very natural ambassadors and fantastic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, people able to really show and uh, motivate others also for, for this. In some other areas, it's, uh, it's much more complicated. And sometimes, um, because the interference between uh, scientific knowledge and also beliefs can also be something which becomes uh, then an issue. And then uh, the situation is uh, much more complicated because you have to, uh, in any statement, you have to uh, separate what is really based on, on facts and what is really based on beliefs. And this can be actually very tricky. And, uh, and uh, definitely, if you look at uh, what's happening in a number of countries now, uh, concerning vaccination, for example, is a very, very serious, uh, um, I mean, problem and actually threat to, 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 the, um, to, to the global health. And uh, so, and again, this uh, is the necessity to be able to make the difference between what is established, what is not established, which is the fundamental of uh, the scientific method. Um, I'd like to pick up on both the citizen science and the open science versus open data points. I'll start with citizen science. Absolutely, I think that open science can really help bridge the gap between researchers and the, the research and the general public. And actually, marine biology is a brilliant example of where that's already happening, where citizen scientists are actually helping interpret whale song and identify whales. Um, in a way that machines couldn't do, and actually you need a huge group of people to do well. At the same time, just as if you're reading a piece of research that's outside your field, sometimes you need the interpretation and analysis to tell you what it means. Sometimes the public need that as well, and I think there is still a role for journalism and other ways of, of explaining things, like WebMD, to make that clear. Lastly, I'd just like to address your point about open science being much broader than the discussion we've had today. You're absolutely right. We chose to focus on open data because open science is a huge topic, and never mind two hours, we would have been here for a week. But it is, it is much bigger than just open data. So we have uh, about a, a minute uh, each uh, left. I guess one thing we can agree on is that there is uh, a lot of potential and there's definitely problems. Um, open science is just a seedling and it'll probably take some time before it matures to its promise and, and potential. But in that transition period, um, I, I just would like to give you a minute each um, to choose really one piece of advice that we should let the early career scientists present to walk away with. What, what, what would message would you have for them? 
Well, my message is a, is a very simple one. I think uh, as uh, scientific communities, because I think they are definitely communities which have their own organization, uh, we have not, put, uh, in a, we have not uh, put enough effort in organizing ourselves on this, and uh, therefore, which means that we scientists have to speak up more and to get better organized and uh, more efficiently organized on these issues, because if they don't, some others will do that in their place, and that will be bad. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think I would say form good habits early on in your career. Do data management plans, cite your own data, cite other people's data. And I think Grace has just stolen what my best piece of advice would be. But I think also I would say to the early career scientists, look outside your own field. Look what other people are doing. Look where the opportunities are for cross-domain collaboration because the future is in multidisciplinary science. Well, I don't have that much to add, I would just a message to the young scientists to get involved in the community. Great. So get involved. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you for attending and for the presentation.